respond to Tony Lahoud, professor from the University of Brussels. He's also the uh, president of the European Society for Molecular Imaging. He'll talk about nanobodies. I don't think we've heard a lot about nanobodies at this nanomedicine meeting. So I think it's very important that you're here and you share with us what nanobodies can do. Okay, thank you. Just checking out how I can go to the next slide. Um, could you help me with that one? No. Okay. Ah, voila. This is Mother Nature. Um, so <laughs> I do feel compelled to answer the, the question of the first speaker uh, on why do we modify uh, um, Mother Nature. So we do use a lot of Mother Nature uh, in producing uh, our compounds, which are nanobodies. Um, but I, well, I will skip to the next slide to and comment on that. So nanobodies are antibody fragments derived from the camelidae. That's why I have this whole zoo of uh, animals that I present uh, on the first slide. Um, these nanobodies, they are uh, these fragments that we use from the heavy chain only antibodies that are found in camels. Um, so it's a different a kind of antibody than that we have. The camels have also the IgGs and all the other families, but they created during evolution an additional set of antibodies which are the heavy chain only antibodies. Now the nanobody is actually the small particle, uh, the the part that will recognize the antigen that we are using in our drug development for diagnostics and therapeutics. Uh, it's a very small fragment, um, but it has actually the same antigen specificity as uh, uh, the ones for monoclonal, but the big difference is it's only one domain, so it's more simple. Where the human has to have two arms to really touch an antigen uh, in the camel, it can do it only with uh, one arm, uh, the leg. So struggling with the thing. So it's only one part. The big advantage in what we are trying to develop, so radioactive uh, imaging, so PET spec but also uh, radionuclide therapy, is that we have very good tissue penetration, so it goes very fast to the target, but it's also eliminated very rapidly. So when it's rapidly eliminated, then you get low toxicity. We discuss here a bit, a lot about targeting, but one of the most important things also is toxicity profile. So we want to have drugs that go fast to target, hit the target, and then get out of the body as quickly as possible so that you don't deliver toxicity. If you're a bit, a bit low in target, well, you can give more of the drug. So this is a, the general principle. How do we do this? Well, in the development, we do need uh, a camel or a dromedary where to immunize and to, to generate a polyclonal response to uh, the target. For example, the HER2 antigen is the example that I will show. Uh, and we do a whole process of panning uh, where we will do a phage display and select out all those antibodies that the camel developed against our target. And in this process, we do a lot of in vitro studies, but we use a lot of imaging also to select out lead compounds because this camel will give you a lot of antibodies against your target. Um, and then it's a quite simple principle. So you have the nanobody, which is, uh, well, the structure is a tenth of a monoclonal antibody, so 15 kilodalton. Um, in nanometer size, it would be like two to three nanometer. Um, you link it to uh, radioactivity using a chelator or directly. It can be for gamma camera or for PET camera. Uh, we tend to do our preclinical screenings all in spec because it's cheaper. Um, when we go to clinic and we want to have some high-end application in diagnostics, so it's with a PET camera because of the higher resolution. But once you have those compounds, we try then to label them with therapeutic radionuclides like iodine-131, lutetium, or astatine, which is an alpha emitter, to have uh, also... Uh, therapeutic uh, effect. There's also some applications on fluorescence, but I will not talk about that. Uh, just the example I wanted to show is the one of the HER2, so it's also already been commented on um, by the previous speaker. So in breast cancer and also gastric cancer, there's overexpression of a certain target, HER2, and what we are, have developed is actually an antibody against uh, HER2, and then radio labeled it for SPECT, PET, and for therapeutics, and this is what I would like to share with you. Um, why HER2? Well, it's a very, uh, well, in breast cancer, big population uh, affected, of course, and 20 to 30 percent are positive. Um, the diagnosis is based on biopsies, but then people get progressive disease and often rebiopsy is necessary. So we wanted to have really a, a method of, uh, well, looking at HER2 expression throughout the body because there's a lot of heterogeneity actually uh, occurring. Um, so it's immune addiction, radio immune detection. 
Um, so how do we develop this? Uh, well, I said, well, uh, after the whole immunization process, we get a lot of uh, um, nanobodies out of this camel, and we select uh, based on in vitro methods, of course, uh, on facts, also biocar to look at binding affinity, K on, K off, um, and typically we would select uh, uh, probes that have good K on and, and a very slow K off so that they, when they stick to the target, they stay at the target and they don't get off quite rapidly. Uh, and typically in the nanomolar uh, affinity. So you do it both on protein, on cells, and then you control if uh, everything is really binding well. Um, and from the set that we get, so it's often uh, 50 to 60 uh, families and then uh, of probes or potential uh, uh, probes that you could have. We try to downsize it to like 10 to 20 before we go into uh, the imaging part. Then we would radio label these nanobodies with technetium, straightforward method of doing uh, of radio labeling with the, with the, uh, at the histidine tail of these uh, nanobodies and inject them into animals. Why do we use these animals? Well, it's basically not to, uh, well, it's to show, of course, the targeting, but it's looking at the biodistribution pattern. So these are spec uh, studies in mice with the SCOF, uh, this is an ovarian cancer, HER2 positive. You see uh, uptake into the cancer. Uh, we also see elimination through the kidney. And in this format with technetium on the uh, nanobody, it kind of sticks long time in the kidney. So this wouldn't be good for toxicity, but in diagnostics, we don't have a big problem because the irradiation is still low. Um, so this is a targeting one. Then you have control nanobodies that do not target, and so this tumor uh, is not uh, being seen. We kind of would 10 to 15 families screen through technetium, and we use the animals just to see if there's no unexpected by distribution pattern that we would observe and validate also the targeting towards the cancer um, and also the retention in the kidney because we've seen that from different clones we can have lower or higher kidney retention and of course the ones you want to develop is the one with the lowest kidney just uh, to limit also toxicity. Typically it's a very fast blood clearance uh, uh, because it's a very small so it's filtered through the kidney um, so this is uh, uh, always more or less the same pattern. But we use the animals to screen really the best probe out of the whole collection. So not only in in vitro methods, but in on also in, in in vivo. And we come to a, a often to a panel like uh, it's like this. So we have all the different clones that we have got out of the camel uh, on based on in vitro. They were all high affinity. We will label them exactly the identically. But you do see. Uh, differences in tumor uptake between the different clones. So we, we, we want to validate them in vitro, in vivo, and so we'll take out the ones with the highest tumor uptake, but then also look at kidney. It can vary enormously. So based on this 3D structure of the molecule and the charge distribution, probably it can have an effect on kidney retention, and we will pick out the one with the relatively lowest uh, kidney of the one that binds highly. So it's a whole screening process. Based with microspect and micro, uh, well, microspect CT with techniques, so it's relatively cheap to do. So you can go also in uh, high throughput. Once you have the spect, uh, well, we have the, the, the lead compound selected. We shift uh, for PET imaging at least uh, to, uh, for the moment, to gallium 68. So this is the structure of the nanobody, and these are actually the loops that do the binding. So the difference between the camel and the human is that one of the binding domains, this CDR, is a very long loop. It's like a finger uh, that can go into a very small uh, site of the antigen. And so in, in our antibodies, these are typically a little bit shorter. We do not want to label, of course, on these loops that will do the recognition of the target. We try to label uh, on the framework, on lysines, and we also have methods for site-specific labeling, uh, but I will not go into detail into that. So it can be labeled with uh, gallium-68, which is very straightforward for going to clinic, still in Europe, uh, but we also try to label uh, with F18 to have a, a wider distribution. So once you do this, we uh, are able, of course, uh, to, uh, uh, well, to go to the clinic. Um, the, uh, we could successfully label this uh, and show it also again in the preclinical, just to uh, not to do too many uh, animal studies, but just to put all the data into the file for the IND and go to the clinic. And um, we, uh, we could do a clinical trial, uh, so we already did a phase one study and are now doing a phase two uh, in patients with breast cancer. And this is, oh, let's go back. Uh, this is a patient with uh, breast cancer. So this is the typical biodistribution in a human. So you see both kidneys and the bladder, so it's eliminated again through those systems. You do see some uh, liver uptake, but this lesion is a breast carcinoma in the right breast. 
We also see here a lymph node metastasis in the axillary region. And so this is uh, just to see the PET-CT scan of, of the same patient. So you see very intense uptake in those lesions. Um, confirming really that this probe is uh, uh, targeting towards the cancer. It was a proven HER2 positive patient, and even within 10 minutes, you can see this targeting in the, in the patient. This picture is actually at 60 minutes post-injection, so you do not have to wait for days and days like you would have to do with zirconium, just gallium-68 and at a reasonable uh, dosimetry of about 6 to 7 uh, millisievert for a scan. Um, so we've done a whole series of these patients and are now uh, trying to validate further uh, the diagnostic potential of this probe um, in, in several phase two studies. However, uh, we do want to do therapeutics. And if you look at this scan, if you do a therapeutics, you will have, uh, well, irradiation of salivary glands, of uh, kidneys, uh, and so on. Um, so this is not ideal. Uh, so we developed further uh, different chemistry approaches and actually started to do uh, radiolabeling with iodine-131 through a linker which we call SGMIB. This is just the chemical formulation of this. If you do this, and then we go into preclinical animal uh, experiments, uh, we'll directly go to the result of that, um, you get actually this pattern of bi-distribution. So this is get spec CT of these uh, mice bearing a positive tumor. And while we see kidney uptake here early after injection, but it's only passing through the kidney, we can see that after four hours, it's already rapidly uh, decreased. And in 24 hours, there's no longer kidney retention while the tumor uptake is still present uh, and uh, relatively high. If you do dosimetry studies on this, you get higher irradiation on your tumor than on your kidneys. So we have a probe that we can try to use in a therapeutic experiment. Uh, in humans. Also this compound now, so this is the big difference with what we saw in the diagnostics. So the targeting is always uh, good, but it's a whole by distribution toxicity profile that we want to know, and that's why we do these preclinical experiments. Um, we come to the conclusion that, well, for this compound, uh, we could try to do a therapeutic experiment, and this clinical trial is actually ongoing, and unfortunately not yet show uh, the data of that, but we did observe similar uh, by distribution pattern in humans, so rapid uh, renal cl clearance. Um, and the good thing to answer also in the discussion of, of what we just had before is that with the iodine 131 labeled compound, we only need, we can only formulate one compound because this is a therapeutic one. In a very low dose, you have a diagnostic scan that you can do on a planar gamma camera, not a high-tech PET camera, because there's only limited PET cameras around in the world, and this type of therapy you would want to spread all over the world. So a simple scan with a low dose of the same therapeutic, and then if the patient is positive, you give a high dose of the therapeutic, meaning you only have to, well, do once also the regulatory pathway uh, for developing uh, this compound which is an advantage. So this is just, I, I also have the dosimetry study, so this is, if you look over time, um, well, typically you see well, a relatively high tumor uptake. It does go down with time, uh, so it does uh, re release uh, again from the tumor, but meanwhile it has been irradiating your tumor for uh, several days. Um, throughout the body you only see, and this, is, uh, the, the, this one is a non-targeting nanobody, you only see basically uh, the kidney, which is actually the pass-through uh, of the kidney, but you end up with a higher dosimetry uh, on your tumor uh, than on your kidney. So we are planning now to give high, well, a do planning a dose escalation study in patients to increase uh, uh, this uh, uh, dose uh, towards tumor. And uh, the, luckily, with that type of molecule or drug, you can always image your patients as well to do the follow-up of your toxicity profile. So. Um, is it efficacious? Well, we have several preclinical experiments now where we have done uh, tests with uh, some of the iodine-131 coupled anti-HER2, where we see uh, a good survival of the animals, while if you do a non-relevant targeting with another nanobody that not ta doesn't target the HER2, also with the iodine-131 labeled, uh, they die just, just like uh, the vehicle uh, solution. So um, we've performed those tests just to put it in the documentation for the clinical trial. Uh, to have the approval also to do the therapeutics uh, in patients. In conclusion, um, I'd like to say so the nanobodies are really a platform technology. Uh, it's like antibodies, so we use just a fragment. I showed the example of HER2, but there's many more examples available uh, for doing this. I do think it's good diagnostics. You can use them in PET cameras and high-end clinical imaging if you're interested in certain targets that you want to image total body to look at cancer sites and expression of a certain target can be HER2 or any other target on a cell membrane. 
But what really is interests me is the therapeutic potential of these molecules. Uh, labeled with IDAN 131, we can do a very simple scan to select the patient out and then give a high dose. It was the first time that we observed that, well, the profile um, of by distribution we target, but we don't stick in kidney. So this is why we, we, we really uh, uh, put it forward uh, for a clinical translation also for these uh, compounds. And this is the group that I'm working with, uh, of uh, well, a big mix of group of radiochemists, radiopharmacists, uh, medical doctors, radiologists, um, and uh, good collaboration with Duke University and many funders. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you, Tony. We have time for two questions. I think I can start. So when, when, when you were presenting it, I was wondering if, if we use toxins. It was initially introduced, toxins are used for antibodies, right? Because mm -hmm. you need potent compounds. Yeah. If you see this biodistribution pattern, you could argue that toxins should be on nanobodies. Well, it Not depends, only radionuclides. It depends on how much of your toxin you want to have on your target. You need to inject quite a lot, I you guess. You need to inject quite a lot. I mean, well, the, the dogma a bit is that a medication has to circulate a long time to accumulate and have the efficacy. I'm, I'm really not in favor of that opinion. I, I prefer a drug that goes in, hits the target within minutes, has a very rapid effect, and then gets out. It means that you can give more of the drug and more of the, of the um, uh, dose at several times. Um, if a drug circulates a long time, it can induce toxicity. And so you shouldn't, if, if, it's, if it gets out that quickly, it doesn't. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if it would work with toxins. It is all about the effect because the, the toxin sometimes really has to get into the cell before it can do its work. With radioactivity, it's not the case. You can sit on the cell and it irradiates several millimeters around of its target. So it overcomes the fact that you do not have to have this intelligent mechanism of getting in. Um, it can overcome uh, somewhat of the heterogeneity because it will irradiate the cell that is maybe not expressing right. HER2. So that's why I think it works. Um, for the toxins, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, maybe I get here. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I, think, I think it very much depends on the kind of drug that you're using. So mm -hmm. I think if I to distinguish between these drugs that are really highly potent and highly toxic, also radioisotope therapeutic ones, they should really rapidly act at the place uh, they are targeted to and then they should be removed. Mm -hmm. uh, for example, a uh, chemotherapeutic drug, uh, if it, as long as it's, as it's encapsulated and does not enter the cells, it doesn't uh, show toxic effects. And I think uh, uh, the nature has optimized uh, proteins and uh, antibodies in a way that they uh, are some kind of immune memory. Mm -hmm. So they should circulate long and only in case that there's inflammation, the endothelial cells get permeable and then they go into the lesion site yeah and then they are also active and start to destroy it so i think it's very depending on the way uh, you see the concept i think for these highly toxic ones and also immunotoxins i would agree with fun uh, the the fast circulating approach with a rapid renal elimination would be most appropriate as for your radioisotopes or chemotherapeutic drugs in contrary where you need to accumulate very high doses mm -hmm. and not only few molecules which may be not enough and there you may rather depend on molecules that uh, also take advantage of the EPR effect. Yeah. I agree that that's, that's also why you, we, so uh, that's why we need to modify uh, the antibody format if we want to deliver the radioiodine uh, towards the cancer, otherwise we would uh, have uh, an enormous hematotoxicity, uh, which you do not want, of course. Yeah. Okay, one more question in the middle. Uh, your, your molecules are so small that you should expect a very rapid uh, renal excretion, as you also showed with uh, diet and libeling, and that should be very ideal for imaging. Mm -hmm. But it's difficult to understand that that's the best for therapy. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you tried the same principle just to try to make the molecule larger and to compare? Oh, yes, we have. Uh, at the moment you, you uh, double the size, you do not see the targeting as intensely anymore. Uh, you can make a multivalence of it. You can also have lifetime extension by having also an albumin binding domain to it. The drug becomes less efficacy if you do that, and you get more toxic toxicity. So if you balance the toxicity between the efficacy, um, so it, you, can, you might have to inject, maybe not for a therapeutic effect, uh, 100 milliquiries of the drug. Um, maybe you could go with 10 milliquiries, uh, but then uh, you will have higher toxicity again. So it's really that balance, and I do think that uh, 
within that size range, you are ideal for getting something rapidly in, irradiate it, and then make sure that it doesn't really irradiate the, the, the bone marrow, which is the dose limiting uh, for radionuclide drugs with monoclonal antibodies, uh, or kidneys, which is uh, the dose rate limiting if you are using a, a simple peptide that is really, uh, that's not metabolized within the kidney. So I do think we're in that window uh, where you have that balance. Um, to really, well, test it, of course, we are now doing the clinical trials to, to show the principle, so uh, we are quite confident that the toxicity will not be the limit, uh, so we can dose relatively high, and we need to do the efficacy trial now, of course, uh, in patients. Um, but I'm quite confident that we will be able to reach that uh, with this type of compound. Uh, but it's a few years of clinical trials to be done, of course. So hopefully you can be back next year or the year afterwards to share with us your I'd clinical be, results. I'd be very happy results. to do that. <laughs> Good. Thank you again.